welcome. Welcome to our uh, College of Engineering Celebration of Faculty Careers Colloquia series. Um, I think I've been to most of them. Maybe I missed one or two. And it's really been a very fascinating and interesting and learning experience, certainly for me. Uh, this, is a, this is a program that we just initiated this year. We did a pilot last year to give a chance to senior faculty, specifically to those who are full professors, to come and talk about their careers, uh, provide their perspective to their colleagues, and maybe plan for the next several years. And, uh, and is, it, it's, it's really interesting to see different perspectives that faculty who have participated so far. But I'm really happy that we're really finishing the year. Today is our last one, and we're finishing with an exclamation mark, if I can say so. And uh, I, I really want to thank Tim that he agreed to actually participate in this. What a, what a, uh, <laughs> I didn't see that part, so. <laughs> um, it's really a great example to all of us, uh, you know, to, to share uh, your experiences as a provost, as a faculty. And uh, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna introduce him because all of you know him. I do want to, since I have the microphone, I, I get a chance to say something. I, I, as, as great a provost as uh, Tim has been, I do want to express my appreciation of his collegiality and him as a colleague. So of course we've known Tim before he was provost. And I can share with you, I, uh, I'm very involved in a College of Engineering Committee we call the Strategic Oversight Committee that, that actually does a pretty uh, serious work. Tim was a member of this committee as a faculty member when it was first founded. And he was the only member that we didn't want to let go because he was doing such a terrific job until finally he became provost and we didn't have a choice. So uh, with that, I'm very pleased to have Tim Sands. Tim. Thank you, Claude. Appreciate it. Um, this is a, a, you know, I made a gesture like my arm was being twisted. And there's some truth to that. I'll, I'll mention that in a little bit. but. Um, this whole thing grew out of, um, at least my participation in it, grew out of a little bit of, I guess you'd call it guilt, or um, feeling like I was left out, or some combination of the two. But back uh, before I became provost, uh, and, and in, in my first year as provost, I was reflecting on my experiences as a faculty member at UC Berkeley, where once you become a full professor, you, you have, you're not done with the latter. They have a step system, so every two years or so you go up for a step increase, and then every several years you go up for a promotion, which involves external letters and what have you, and higher and higher bar, and that doesn't stop. You essentially continue that through your whole career. And I remember reflecting on the cumbersome nature of that process and thinking that this is something that uh, I would never create at another institution if I had control over it because it takes so much time. You have all these external letters. But as I left that, I started left that environment, I started uh, thinking back on one very positive side effect, and that is that every couple of years you had a serious conversation with your head, your mentors, you were talking about what you could do to increase your impact, how could you advance your career, even if you were satisfied with it, what could you do to take that next step? Because that bar kept going up. So that part of it I thought was outstanding. And, um, when I became provost, we started the process of uh, going through the promotion and tenure document and looking to uh, upgrade it, modernize it, uh, since it hadn't changed since the mid-70s. And we had a very many, several committees and, and involved in this, and we got through that process. And matter of fact, the draft is under consideration right now, the various committees. So hopefully that'll make it through over the next academic year. But um, at the same time, the College of Engineering was starting to look at strategic planning, and, and one of the issues had to do with faculty careers and faculty development. 
So when I saw this uh, Celebration of Faculty Careers Colloquium come out of the College of Engineering while it was provost, I thought, well, that's interesting. This might be the way, or one model for doing this, uh, for having this conversation in a way that wasn't quite as cumbersome as the UC system. So um, then, you know, fast forward uh, um, a couple of years, and um, one of your colleagues um, who's sitting in the room right over there <laughs> said, uh, who was uh, a participant in this uh, colloquium a few weeks back said, you know, you really need to do this. This is, you need to have an administrator do this since you're imposing this process on us. It was not, said it much nicer than that, but uh, <laughs> uh, well, okay, that's fair enough. Um, and I got to thinking about uh, what I might talk about and uh, it just happened that it coincides with my last days at Purdue. So I'm gonna take a little bit um, more of a uh, focus on my career the kind of conversation I might have in private, but rarely would have in public. Matter of fact, I've never had this conversation in public except for with small groups of students who have a different kind of interest in, in having discussions about careers. When you're talking to your colleagues, you know, most of the time you're talking about research and uh, teaching and things that faculty, faculty uh, careers and not so much about administrative careers. So I'm going to, um, probably deviate from the typical uh, conversation. This first bullet is what um, has been my interest for 30 some years, uh, and that's uh, material science and nanotechnology. And uh, I, you know, we're, it, it happens that um, in my career, you know, things go up and down, but if I, if I look at that first bullet, um, it's a very exciting time in my own research career. Uh, I started a project uh, 25 years ago a personal goal to develop a metal semiconductor super lattice. That was when I was at Belcor. And uh, we, kept, we tried and we tried and we, we published lots of papers and made fits and starts progress. We finally have that figured out. And uh, it's a, now a collaboration with, with Sasha and uh, Vlad and a few others and some really productive graduate students. I've got two left in my group and who are finishing up their PhDs at Purdue and then a couple of others who are uh, joint with other faculty here. And uh, so this is a really vibrant time for me um, I, I, in my research career, even though I only spend several hours a week on it. Uh, and, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to talk more about my career trajectory reflecting back. So it's kind of like a private conversation with you. You're all my, my heads and I've, I'm a faculty member in your department. That's the way you should think about it. And um, so uh, I, I want to give you a sense for what uh, my career has been like and what in reflecting uh, back on it, what I think I should have done and what I might do going forward and how you can help me if you think of me as a faculty member. Of course, I'm going to be skipping out in a bit, but, but so it's a bit of role playing, but uh, we'll get to that. Uh, I'd also like an interesting week for me too. I, I don't, I've never been a co-author on a paper, an author on a paper in the uh, proceedings for, uh, of the National Academy of Sciences. But this week, I'm a co-author on two papers in PNAS. Uh, one is with these two uh, researchers here, Vlad and Sasha, on uh, the metal semiconductor super lattice and applications to uh, plasmonics and metamaterials. And the other is on um, the role of, uh, of patents and intellectual property in promotion and tenure. So these are completely different topics, and they represent my you know, the dichotomy in my own life at the moment. So again, I, but I'm gonna talk about the, the, uh, the career part of it more than anything else. And the purpose for doing this, I think, uh, in this environment, uh, and hopefully it'll be a, a fairly quick presentation, we can have a chance for some discussion. But um, I really think that uh, if I go through this, maybe it will cause you to reflect on your own careers, and maybe you'll ask some questions you might not have asked. That's my hope, and uh, we'll see. So um, I, I had to think, uh, and this is all recent thinking. This is not something I've been thinking about for a long time, and it's really kind of personal. It's not, you, know, you have to think about why, how did you get to where you are and uh, why, and I started thinking about uh, my path and what I'm, decisions I made along the way. And for me, most of them are about how can I have the most positive impact on, on people, essentially, and if I have a fork in the road, I have generally chosen the path that I thought would have the more positive impact. Early in my career, these were research-oriented decisions or teaching 
you know, impacting students uh, directly uh, through engaging with them in the classroom or, or advising them as PhD students. Or um, the, really early in my career, the students weren't there, and it was an industrial research position, and I was really thinking about technology, technological impact. How could I change the way that, it, that you experience uh, technology around you? Uh, my work on solid state lighting with my uh, students and what have you did some of that. You know, that. That's something where I have gadgets in my house that had, were manufactured by techniques that I had a small part in. And that gives you great fulfillment as an engineer. But um, when I think back and try to look at all those uh, transitions that I made, what was the common theme? And it was an attempt uh, to have more impact. But um, the constraints have always been, and they probably are for you too, uh, your other, the other things that are important to your family, um, they're also your, your health. And, and if there's one thing I'm thankful for particularly is that I managed to avoid getting myself into any difficult health situ uh, situations, and the, the family's done fine. So it's... It's, those have always been constraints. I mean, those, and you have, may have a completely different motivating set of factors. Uh, I don't mean to say this is what everyone should do. It's just what is the common theme and what, uh, when I look back retrospectively. So I, but one thing I, I also noted when I look back on my career is that I've not planned and I've reacted. And um, the big question is, where would I be if I had done more planning? And uh, and really, the answer, the question for you is where would you have be, be if you had done more planning? Now, some of you probably were more planful than I was, and uh, hopefully that was a good thing for you. But I look back, and I had no plan. Uh, I did focus on enjoying what I was doing at the moment, but I, every time I hit a juncture, it was a surprise. At least I thought it was a surprise. Um, so I, as an engineer, you know, I like to make diagrams and think about how do you categorize things. You need a taxonomy. You need, you need some kind of a, a way of thinking about these things. So when I think about my career, it certainly wasn't a smooth trajectory, and I bet everyone here will agree with that. Uh, your career has not been a smooth trajectory. There are, it's, a, it's a trajectory for a period of time, and then there's a juncture. There's a decision you have to make, or you don't have to make. You can ignore it, but there's an opportunity that comes up, and you make that, that jump or you don't. And there are easier decisions if I'm plotting sort of impact versus time, and that, that tan diamond represents the decision point. Um, that's e easy. When you see the opportunity to move up and have more impact, uh, you're going to take that route, especially if you think you've kind of saturated doing what you're doing. But then there are harder decisions, and I've encountered a few of those, and I think you have too, where you, the, the way forward might be either staying where you are or taking a path that uh, looks like it's going to make incremental improvement forward, where the other option looks like a promotion or looks like an advance, but then you think, okay, downstream, it, I don't see the future there. That doesn't look like it, it works. And so when I look through a lot of my decisions, they look more like that second one. So um, what happens at one of these junctures, and this, again, is very personal what I do. Uh, it may not be what you do. But uh, I always convene the family. I mean, we literally, um, my transition to Purdue was a long conversation over about six months. But the big convening was a decision to go visit uh, uh, um, the Yosemite for the first time. I spent 37 years in California, never been to Yosemite. So in 2001, or two, no, 2002, uh, the family decided to go on a few days hike in Yosemite and see the valley and do some hiking. Never had, I'd never been there before, which is crazy. Many of you have been to Yosemite, even who, people who don't live in the West Coast, on the West Coast. But uh, so uh, we had conversations on that hike, and that was really where we decided to come to Purdue. And so that convening of family is important to me. But really, it's important, and it had a huge influence on me, and some of the, my mentors are in the room but it's also having a conversation with the people who are your mentors. And these aren't people I ever labeled as mentors. I have to tell you, they never, I never called them a mentor. They never called me a mentee. It was just they're people that pop up in your life at various times, various critical times, and they may do so over a period of many decades, and they just seem to be there when you hit a transition. And uh, so those are people that were very important to me, and I still uh, will continue to utilize those people. And then when you, when you hit that decision point, you make a decision, you've got to jump in. And again, that's just uh, it's kind of obvious, but, but uh, you have to make a decision at some point. You can't just ponder it forever. 
So um, again, I'm going to go through this uh, decision tree thing for my own career. Hopefully, there's something in there that's interesting. If not, um, you can tell me later. <laughs> but uh, I started off in 1984. I got my PhD. And my first big uh, decision was to defer an academic career uh, in favor of industry. And looking back on that, um, I'm pretty convinced I made the right decision. But I'll talk about that, my perspective on that, in a moment. But uh, I had an opportunity. I was one of two candidates for a faculty position at Stanford. And interestingly, the other candidate at the time is now a university president. So anyway, and we were friends. And, uh, um, and my, one of my mentors at the time called me up at night one night and said, pull out, pull out. And so I, I called up the search committee the next day and pulled out. And uh, that's a whole long story, but I'm glad I did. And then at that point, my backstops were two uh, industrial positions that were really spectacular. I wish those kinds of positions existed now. They're, not, they're few and far between. But I had an opportunity to go to Belcor in New Jersey. And uh, the, this was essentially deferring my, my dream, which was to be a university professor. But really, when I looked at the opportunity to be a university professor right after my PhD, it wasn't the right time. I didn't have much to give back. You know, that wasn't, I, there wasn't much I could teach to someone who was four years younger than I was. And you know, I was still trying to learn how to navigate the research world. So I'm really glad I made that decision. I have no idea how it would have worked out. But my perception was that it would have looked good to have a faculty position at Stanford right out of my PhD. But I don't think I would have gotten where I, where I am now with, if I had gone that route. That's just, again, that's a retrospective and it's a perception. My next one was um, an interesting obstacle at, at Bell Communications Research. I had been there nine years. Um, it, the business model for Bellcore was uh, wrong. It didn't make any sense. We started realizing it five years into Bellcore. Uh, and then we had a few years of ambiguity and then some clarity in about 1991 that this thing wasn't going to go forever. And so I saw at um, that point that there was a brick wall in front of me. It wasn't a, a really solid wall because there was an option, and that was to leave my field and go to another field and stay at Belcor and develop a career in what you might call software, but in coding and that kind of thing, and very far from what my expertise is. In fact, I didn't even like it when I was a student, so it wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. Um, and so I, uh, I, I didn't. I saw that brick wall. It was pretty solid. I thought, OK, well, um, I spent, uh, I was a manager by that point um, of a research group. And I spent all of my time for a couple of years working with the PhDs in my group to find them academic positions. And we had 150, and only, uh, I think, eight or nine in my group, but about 150 in our lab. And most, almost all of them found spectacular positions. And I, was, I wasn't thinking about what I was going to do at that point, but I was worried about it. I wasn't active about it. I was just kind of going through the motions. But one of my uh, former students at, uh, or a colleague actually at, uh, at Berkeley as a student, but uh, he was a member of my group, he came to me one day and had a, uh, uh, one of our professional magazines. And had, there was an ad in there for a position at Berkeley, my alma mater, my department. And it looked like it was written for me. I, it was nine years later. And I know it wasn't written for me. But I read it. And it was exactly what I do. I thought, well, this is kind of a sign. I better apply for that. And a long story short, I ended up going back to my alma mater. Took a big hit in salary. Took a big hit in um, standard of living. We had four little kids. Um, my wife took a bit, bit of a hit, too. She was a, a research uh, scientist at, um, at various institutes around New Jersey and Philadelphia in gerontology. And she was kind of hopping from, uh, from a research position to another research position. And she was doing the thing with the four little kids. So she was really a faculty member at, or a, a researcher at about 50% effort through that period. And this move was, um, took her to UCSF, which was a big plus. UC, UC San Francisco is a great, uh, great institution. Uh, but with all the commuting that we had in front of us, and it just, I don't know how we or why we did it, but we took a big jump 
to go back to the Bay Area. We also thought our families from the Bay Area, so we thought this was going to be good. But it turns out, by the way, in New Jersey, we saw more of them because they come out and spend two or three weeks with us instead of the 15 minutes that we had with them in California. But um, we, did, we made the jump. And I, again, I, no regrets, but it was a step down, and it was a challenge, and um, uh, it, was, it turned out to be a great experience. Uh, the next one, which uh, we were laughing about before this because um, my colleagues in materials know about this, uh, right? Uh, and so I had been there for almost nine years or so at Berkeley, and um, about six years into it, my colleagues at Berkeley said, you are the next department chair. Now, they, they have rotating department chairs, and, um, and it, it really wasn't my turn. I, I really felt like there were five or six people ahead of me who or behind me, depending on how you look at it. But <laughs> five or six people who owed the department that before I did. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really look at it as an opportunity, but um, I, I, I tried to convince the dean that it was a bad idea. Uh, remember, I still think I have the letters I wrote about you know, who would it be better, why, and, and I, I was sincere about it. I wasn't trying to get out of a, an obligation. I just thought it wasn't right for me. And I knew it wasn't right for my, my career. I got my family together, and they told me that. They said, no, 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 you don't, you don't want to go there. We know the politics. We know what, what you'd be stepping into. It's the wrong time to do it. And so I listened to my family, and I told the dean, no, I'm not going to do it. And he said, yes, you are. If you're going to stay here, you're going to do it. And I said, I'm going. <laughs> and uh, so I went. And, uh, but there was something. Of course, I had a card to play. It wasn't, I didn't just jump off uh, the cliff. I, I had been talking to Purdue, and I was so enamored with what was going on at Purdue in terms of Discovery Park. It was not, there was no shovel in the ground, but the money was there and the concept was there. And it was a research environment that I had left at Belcor and could not rediscover at Berkeley. Berkeley's a great institution, but every department had its own building. And, you know, it just, it, it just was the opposite of what I wanted. And uh, uh, so coming to Purdue was a great move uh, for a lot of reasons, commute being one of them. From, and, but just the whole, the family benefits are uh, tremendous. All four of our kids are Boilermakers. Uh, we're we're going to end up with five degrees, Purdue degrees between them uh, within the next year, and then a fiance of my son's who's gonna, who is a Purdue grad. So no, no house divided it in our house. <laughs> Uh, no Hokies among them, but, uh, and that won't change either. I think that's another generation. So um, I did decide to make the jump to Purdue in 2002. It, I have to say, though, that, that I really saw the upside of that. I didn't see a downside to it. It really looked good. Um, the downside was leaving Berkeley, which was my home, academic home and, and actually uh, family home. But uh, you know, I, I was a little concerned about the quality of the so-called quality of the grad students. It turns out that was I actually did an analysis of that after I'd had many PhD students here, and I couldn't find a difference. I really looked in terms of productivity and my uh, you know the whole range at both places. So I won't go into details in case any of them are here. But uh, but no, but I really didn't see the distinction in the end. That was the only thing I really worried about. So. Um, the next step uh, for me and was to accept the position as Burke director. That was not on my trajectory at all, never in my plan. In fact, I was trying to avoid it because, or anything like that. I had just gotten out of being a department head, and I thought, well, this is great. I'm smooth uh, cruising from 2002 to 2006 as a faculty member, teaching classes, loved to, to teach. Uh, I was able to develop my own courses. And, uh, and then had a really fun time over at the, at the Burke Center, or with the Burke community before we had the building. But I was on the search committee for the Burke director, and uh, Dick Schwartz asked me to uh, resign. So I resigned, and then I ended up as a candidate. And when I went to talk to my family about that, had that convening, they said, this one you should do. This one is good. The other one, no, but this one's good. And then. Uh, of course, that was a great experience. But in 2010, uh, Tim Fisher, and I have vivid memories of this, our colleague in mechanical engineering, came into my office at Burke and said, you got a Fisher cut bait. And I had no clue what he was talking about. <laughs> so anybody who knows Tim knows that that's kind of the way he talks. And uh, he had thought through this thing, elaborate thing. I don't know, he had, I don't know how long he had been thinking about it. But he, he, he had this elaborate decision tree thing for me and what my future was going to be. And I said, well, what, what, are the, what is the fishing and what is the cutting bait? What, 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 tell me. 
uh, because I had been Burke director for four years and I had planned to do another year and then go back to the faculty, um, having figured that was about right. And um, he said, well, the provost position's open. And I said, well, I don't know anything about being a provost. That's not, I haven't been ahead, a dean, you know, and, and I don't have any interest, I don't think. Uh, but a lot of conversations over a period of days, it really wasn't even weeks, um, I talked to the family, got them together, and they basically said, you know, you've been every Sunday, all the kids come home from Purdue, and we have conversations about what we like and don't like at Purdue, and you seem to be really interested in the undergraduate experience too, not just the research and the grad students. So uh, they convinced me to go ahead and try, uh, and uh, I, I did. I ended up as a finalist, and, and the way I got that position, by the way, was I didn't want it, so I thought I gave, I had an opportunity to speak in, in a forum like this, and I just said what I thought was the truth and figured that that would end any possibility. <laughs> but just so you know, that, that is a, a recipe for getting a position. And I figured that out afterward. But if you ever want a position, tell the truth and you might get it. And if you don't get it, it's a good reason you didn't get it. And you don't need it and it's a good thing. So um, the next uh, big uh, transition for me was accepting the position of acting president after France Cordova had announced she was leaving in July of 2012. And, and then Mitch Daniels was the next president starting in January of 2013. He'd already committed to finishing his second term as governor. Okay, you know, he, he couldn't really get out of that. And so there was a six month period and the board came to me and asked if I would be acting president. I thought, well, this is crazy. This is not only is this not in the plans, it's, uh, it's, a, it's probably a career-ending move for me, um, my, especially my research. Even at six months, I thought this was going to swallow me up. But it sounded like fun. You know, it sounded like something, well, six months is a great trial period to try and see if you can have more impact. And so, um, and, and have some fun, too, and just stretch yourself, jump in over your head. So I feel very fortunate to have had that opportunity, but I did see that there was a potential brick wall in front of me if I said no because the provost normally is the one they go to when they need a backup. And uh, I don't know what the plan, you know, I didn't even think too hard about what the alternatives were. It wasn't my problem. But uh, I, you know, it was something that I thought, well, I probably have to do this. If I imagine saying no, what would, that trajectory was probably over. That's okay. I mean, I could easily go back and have fun as a faculty member. But, but I thought, well, these opportunities don't come along too often and you better, try it at least, and six months is a good period. So the next one and the last one I'll mention in, is uh, the VT presidency, which is something, again, I didn't plan on it, but everybody told me that after I finished uh, as acting president that you will, you will be contacted frequently by search firms. And because you, they don't even know you, but they've seen your name as an acting president of the Big Ten, so you know, they will be after you. And I thought, well, probably not. And, but about six months after, all of a sudden, all of the big firms had me at their top of the list, and they were not the top of the list, but you know, in the list of people that they wanted to talk to. And I, I didn't agree to talk to too many, but there were some that were persistent. And Virginia Tech um, was one that the first conversation was in August of last year was, um, you know, well, tell me about it. I'm kind of curious, but I wasn't that interested. I didn't, Virginia Tech was off the radar for me. I had great respect for the institution, but I didn't know much about it, really. And uh, it wasn't in my circle. I didn't know anybody really there. But a series of conversations, and then finally, um, I got to the point where I realized that I had better fish or cut bait. In other words, it's okay to go through a process like that, but once you get to the point where they're thinking about making you a finalist, you better be ready to say yes if they offer it to you. And that was a scary, that was my jumping off the cliff there, is getting to the point where I felt like I could say yes. Turns out Virginia Tech was one personally that, that I could say yes to. There were others that I was, talk, I was talking to at the time that I really, had they asked me that question, I would have said no, which is weird, you know, why, why go that far? So um, it was, uh, it, that's the last one. And I see mostly upside, but a lot of, it's scary. You know, it's scary to take a, a step like that. The biggest fright, frightful uh, moments I have are over, this may really be the end of my research career. I've gotten, my last two PhD students will finish up uh, in the next uh, couple of months. 
And they're taking, I mean, they're, they've, if I were a junior faculty member, I would be writing on the stuff that they're doing right now and building a whole career out of it. And I just, you know, I, that's, I'm not going to have time for that. So I have, over the last few months, have convinced myself that there is life after being an active researcher. <laughs> but of course, as soon as I went to uh, Virginia Tech, my new colleagues there started saying, hey, we've, we've got this new initiative. We want you to be part of <laughs> so, I'm afraid I'm, I might be back um, doing that, but we'll see. So just some observations based on uh, that trajectory. Um, you know, one thing I, I really think worked out well for me, or has worked out well, is while you're between these big decision points, that you're always trying to push up your impact. You know, just push, 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 and as hard as you can, and not thinking too hard about what's in the future, but really focusing on the here and now. I don't know if I had been a better planner, maybe I, that would have been harder to do, but, but I, I think looking back, that, that is essential because if you're not pushing when you're in a position you're in, even if it isn't the perfect position for you, uh, you're not gonna have those opportunities pop up. And I think the really interesting one is the second one, which is a realization I came to when I was making these little diagrams. If you notice that all of my um, choices, the solid lines, uh, showed me ending up ahead of where my, the dotted line, the option, would have taken me. But that's clearly a perception that I have in retrospect. It has nothing to do with reality, um, and you can't do the experiment. So um, who knows? I mean, I, I could have taken another option, any of those, and they could have, I could have been better off. But I don't know that, and I just inherently I don't believe that um, because that's my nature. That may not be everybody's nature, but that's, that's the way I think about it. So the real question is, can you plan to bring on that next juncture? Because I never did that, and sure, it's worked out okay but for me, but, uh, um, and it's probably worked out okay for you or you wouldn't be here. But is there something more that I could have gotten by having a more deliberate thought process about what that ne next step might be? And I often, that, it almost haunts me, and that's why the, the, uh, uh, the conversations we were having a few years ago about the faculty career, <laughs> Well, that we better take seriously. I think that means we evacuate, but unless there's a... Yeah, that's funny. Well, we'll see if it pops back on. If so, we will safely exit the building. Um, so really, I wanted to turn this over. I've talked ab uh, about myself for a lot here, and, and that's weird for me, but, but uh, I'd like to sort of turn this around a little. You know, could I have been more intentional, more active? What if I had been more sy systematic about reviewing my career periodically? And what if I had taken advantage of a mentor, whether it's a department head or someone that is important to you in your career? So I wanted to flip this around, though, too, and I'm wrapping this up here, and then we'll have a conversation unless we're kicked out. Um, you know, you're, you, most of you are probably more in the mentor role than you are in, you know, focused on, the, on your own career. And, and you should be doing both, obviously. But, but when I reflect back on the kind of conversations that I wish I had had more often, uh, they, they involve questions like this. And, and they are, you know, are you too content with your steady career progress? There have been many times in my career, many, many, several probably, where I have been on a productive bent, and you know, if you think about research, for example, you know, maybe publishing at a decent rate, happy with citations, happy with invited talks, you know, whatever it may be that you measure, you use to measure your own progress. And and I think if someone had asked me, you know, four years into that track, that segment of my career, um, is this really the biggest impact you can have? Um, would you be better off maybe taking six months and, you know doing another sabbatical or, and refocusing or, or studying another field or jumping from material science to biology or whatever it may be. Um, I never had those conversations and I, I wish I had. I don't know what would have happened, but I think it's really important as a mentor that you are the one asking, those conversa asking people who come to you, you know, are you really happy with your career progress? Is there something more you can do? Are you in a rut that you really don't recognize? I think ruts can be very productive. You can have a productive rut, but, but if there's another path that's vastly better, or could be, um, maybe you need to take the jump. 
And uh, you know, always this question about, maybe you don't ask it directly, but are you being too risk averse? Are you, are you too frightened to think about what you might risk um, in order to take another step? And also as a, as a mentor, and any department heads or deans here, but any senior faculty as well, know that this is a really important. It's, it's one thing to have the, the conversation, but you also have to have some actions behind it. Uh, one is identifying uh, and trying to lower barriers. So if there are, um, if you're having a conversation with someone who's having this career discussion about, oh, well, they're on a trajectory, uh, they're happy with it, but uh, th there might be something more. Uh, once you identify what that more might be or what that other trajectory might be, you know, your role is to help lower the barriers, to see what is it that is in the way from you doing this. And it might be creating a safety net. It might be saying, okay, you're worried about failing in this, if you try this other trajectory, um, I'm going to give you a situation that will protect you. You, you can still fail, but, but you won't crash and burn. Um, the other part of it, the other half of it, is raising aspirations. And I, you know, I, this may or may not be relevant to a faculty member who typically has very high aspirations. But I think there are always higher aspirations. And I see this with students, too, that you really want to have in the conversation a question about how, high, how far can you push. Because most people will say that I want to do a little better and have a little more impact. Uh, but they, they have potential that's much greater than what they recognize themselves. And uh, it's important for you in that role as a mentor to be, be saying not only, you know, how can I help you get where you want to go, but are, have you really uh, asked yourself, is, is that all you can do? And, and can you do something more? And um, the talent in this room and all around Purdue and any institution like this is far, far greater in potential than what is actually achieved. And I, I think that's an important question you have to keep asking and promoting. And then, of course, one has to find resources and facilitate experiences. So I just wanted to flip this around and just talk a little bit about being a mentor. So that's all I had to say for, for this, at least my part of the conversation. Um, we've got, I think, at least a, a few minutes to have a conversation back. So I'd be happy to take any questions or challenges to some of the things I've said. Again, it's been really a focus on my own career, and that's a little awkward, and it's probably the last time I'll ever do it. But uh, and until the next seven years, if I were here, I'd have to sit down with Regu and, and have that conversation. By the way, where is Regu? You're here, yeah. So, so now you have to sit down with me and help me plan this next step. So yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks very much for your attention. Any stories anyone wants to tell? Question, did you consider any? more quantitative metrics than impact, uh, such as salary, such as, <laughs> such as books, such as invited lectures. Uh, you know, those things could all be charted versus time the way uh, mm -hmm. you have this loose term of impact. Well, I, I guess I could have, but you know what happened in, has happened in my particular career, and I think a lot of you have had this experience, you know, the, the things that you would measure to measure impact change as you, as you change trajectories. So a lot of the things that I looked at early in my career, I don't pay attention to. Some I do, but I don't pay attention to so much. So that would be interesting. The salary thing I never looked at. And that's just my you know, personal thing. Um, it drives some of my uh, family members cra crazy, <laughs> but I never, you know, I didn't spend time on it. Not to say that it isn't a good metric. That might drive, you know, it reflects the value that others perceive that, that you are able to deliver. And so um, it has some meaning, but uh, it never was a driver for me. I um, think uh, because I'm not a, I mean, I, I, uh, I won't get into my personal financial habits, but they're, they're not very disciplined. Let's put it that way. Don't spend a lot of time on it. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, some things that have really been consistently important to me are citations of research papers. Um, uh, that's something that ever since the very beginning has been important to me. But that's about the only thing I can think of that has stayed with me throughout the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was curious about your, your first step after uh, Balfour to UC Berkeley. Um, since I'm in a younger stage of my career, uh, you know, what was it for you? Because you had four kids away. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you're going to move across country and you're going to go from industry to academia, which is probably the biggest jump that mm -hmm. any, any uh, professional can imagine making. Um, and as much as you're comfortable answering, you know, what are some of the details in the thought process? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, that's a great, I mean, so one of the things that motivated me, and I think that I bet I'm speaking to the choir as I say, um, as an industrial researcher, I had nine great years in, at Belcor, um, very productive from a research standpoint, loved the work, but the question was always, what, what have you done for me lately that, that you know, it, you're, you're making some impact that goes well beyond the company, but in terms of what the, how the company views it, you know, what is your, the last six months? Describe your impact over the last six months. And uh, the thing you miss in that environment, at least I missed after a while, was the longer term impact. And by, by longer term impact, I'm talking about students, and interacting with students and developing their careers. And I had, an, uh, I had enough experience with that as a senior PhD student with mentoring other students that I knew that that was incredibly valuable to me. And so I had missed that for nine years. There were some students around, but they weren't you know, I, I didn't have a chance to impact them really. Uh, when I came to Berkeley, that became obvious to me. I mean, as you know, as if, if you're a faculty member, uh, you're, especially your PhD students are your, part of your family. They're part of your academic family, but it actually goes a little deeper than that. Um, I, I have probably one of the best uh, experiences I've ever had, which is just a spontaneous experience in the moment, is going to a conference that I'd been to for the last 25 years and having one of my former PhD students, who was then a professor at Stanford and just gotten tenure, introduce me to my academic grandchildren. And uh, that's the way he said, I want you to meet your grandchildren. <laughs> and there's this big group of well, motley bunch, but, but, but uh, that's... You know, I'm sure any, any of you who've had, been a professor for more than five or six years or seven years have had that experience. It's a great experience. So that, that was a good side. The bad side was just a um, very difficult thing to do. I mean, I had not taught, I had not been trained to teach, so that was scary. That was the biggest cliff I've ever jumped off, really, is to just go up in front of a classroom. Back then, they didn't have any preparation for faculty. You just walked in and did it. And uh, I still have vivid memories of the first guest lecture I gave. It was a disaster, and I, I learned so much from it. But uh, it, it, that was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah, Flat? Well, I have, I have a disclaimer to make here. Mm -hmm. When I started to collaborate with you, mainly Sasha, but uh, some an oblique way myself as well, I, I thought it, this is just yet another collaboration. So I honestly haven't realized what a great researcher you are. And now when we are traveling both Sasha and me and we started to keep, uh, kind of, to keep hearing kind of feedback on what we have done and so on. And everybody says, you guys, you guys so lucky to, to, to work with team. And just like most recently, Northwest and Sasha visited them and they would say, and yeah, you helped us to start entirely new field, which I'm not sure we would be able to without you. My point here, any regrets that if you stay in research and you are doing such a wonderful work, I mean, okay, you're a great provost, I'm sure you will be a great president, uh, but probably there are other people who could do the same. I mean, it's too late, No, 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 he's asking you if I have regrets. I, here. I mean, being a researcher, it's always very unique, mm -hmm. good researcher. Mm -hmm. And well, I think I, you are, you're the key. So. Well, I, I really appreciate that's very fl uh, kind of you to say. Um, I, you know, I, I, my identity as is as a researcher. That's what I started with in the '80s, 1980, and it's still really important to me. But um, I think, again, what what that's why sort of getting back to Dick Grace's question, what do you measure as your impact? And there are other things that seem have become important to me. Not not that I've given up that. I still, I don't want to let it go. But it can be 10% of my life, and I feel like it's okay. I don't think it can be zero. That's the big struggle. But it could be 10%, and I, f I still feel connected because I have, can collaborate with people like you. And that's a that in the students. It's just I really don't want to give that up. But there are um, there's an advantage to getting involved in um, jobs like a department head. I mean, not so much as the department heads. <laughs> That's a tough one, you guys. <laughs> Those of you who are department heads. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, when, you, when you 
the provost level, one thing that you find out is you've got this huge university that's got all these disciplines and really interesting people and you, you have a chance to um, learn from all of them and make connections. You know, so um, you, the being, I'll, I'll give a sales job for being a provost. Um, the, you know, one thing I learned rather quickly being a provost was that there was life beyond science and engineering, that there's a, an incredibly rich humanities uh, a spectrum, um, arts uh, at a university like this, the social sciences, the professional schools, so I, I've learned a little bit about all of those disciplines, and uh, it, you know, it, if you're getting bored at all with your own, and I, not to say I was bored, but, but there, it's always stimulating. And you can make connections, too. So that's the thing that, you know, one of the things I will say about Virginia Tech, and it, that Purdue is a, overall, you know, is a very strong institution, and Virginia Tech um, looks at Purdue as, a, as an aspirational peer because there's so much in parallel and it's not as developed of an institution, hasn't been around as long as, as a state university. It's, been a, it's a land grant with a large engineering presence. But what they've done is connect the arts and technology in a way that hasn't happened yet at Purdue. And that's really stimulating. So if you're a, a scientist and a technologist and some, someone brings the arts in, you know, all, a whole new area opens up. May, I will never be a leader in that, but you can just, uh, enjoy uh, facilitating it and being part of it. So I, I think, Vlad, you should become a provost. Or maybe you should skip that. Wait a minute. Just, Wait a minute. Just, I have to say this. At some right. point, I consulted a mentor, this gentleman, Tim Sands, and said, well, let's not, how about considering some administrative jobs? He told me, Vlad, do your research. You're not going to do Absolutely, but, and I'm but, grateful to you for saying well, this. Yes, the, 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 we're having a conversation, and you're changing my mind. <laughs> you should be a university president. You've grown so much. Just skip the provost thing. I, you know, I just convinced myself that's a bad idea for you. Yeah, Peter. Um, yes. Well, first of all, as an assistant professor, let me just say thank you for putting yourself in the same position that I'm in, being constantly scrutinized. <laughs> uh, then I want to ask you a real question, which was, um, like, do you see, uh, I guess, fundamentally, research is kind of the biggest impact that universities can provide, like, broadly speaking? And then, if so, do you think the, the general public really appreciates that? Because I think that we, like, kind of in this group, kind of, kind of see, like, how important the research mission is and how it's, like, so foundational to what we do here and at Virginia Tech and many other research ones institutions, but do you think that that's a conversation we should have like, with a broader audience? Well, yes, I, I do, but I, I think, um, and maybe my perspective's changed a little, I uh, do think that the most important thing we do is preparing the next generation. That's, and, and the reason I, I say that is maybe it, maybe it doesn't make sense to, uh, to some of you because of your trajectory, your own trajectory, but having been an industry where in an older, in a, in a past time that doesn't really exist now. So it's, it's all, it may be all irrelevant. But um, in my experience at Belcor, the level of the science and the level of the technological imp impact was higher than I've ever seen at a university, any university, not even close. And uh, because that's all we had to do, we had an unlimited budget, we were all in the same building, we weren't divided up by discipline. And it was all about intellectual stimulation. And you know, lunch was the best time of the day. Everybody went into the same place. And we tossed around these ideas from all over the place. And we went back to the lab and did it. And it was just, you, know, you cannot, that is such a rich experience. So when I made the jump to Berkeley as a professor, I knew I was giving up at least some of that. And that my attention had to turn to preparing the next generation. And that's rewarding. And, and can you balance the two? Yeah, you can. Matter of fact, the, the really uh, the struggle we've all got is that industry, you don't have a Belcor in these days. And you don't have the AT&T Bell Labs or the IBM uh, of the past. Or in your field, you can pick whatever had, to, had an organization like that. Um, you just don't have them out there anymore. And, and where they exist, the, the number of positions that are available are handfuls of positions. You don't find it, in my experience, in national labs 
Uh, I mean, you could, but it's just not pervasive in a national lab. You don't find it in other countries that much. It, it really was, I think, a uniquely American thing from the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, and maybe stretching in, you know, sort of Sputnik onto um, maybe uh, the 1990 time frame. And uh, I, I feel very fortunate to have been part of that. So when I, when I think back on that part of my career, and then I think about my role as a faculty member, it sort of, it, the perspective is mainly focused on preparing the next generation. I love to do, the, the research is great too, but I don't think we can, we're divided, you know, we, we spend our time at, divided. It's not, those aren't the only two things we do. We also are an engagement university, which is very important to Purdue. So um, your, your effort is divided, and you're looking for synergies between these things to, for it to make sense, because if there's no synergy between them, it doesn't make any sense. So you can do a little of all of those, but you can't have the kind of impact you would have just in research at, a, at, a, at what now is an imaginary <laughs> organization that I really don't think exists anymore. Uh, out of this sort of depressing thought, but um, but no, I think I think we have to communicate what we do better. Industry is more and more expecting the universities to partner with them and be their research lab. So whereas my experience at Bellcore or Bell Labs, uh, we were the re the core research. We didn't farm anything out. Frankly, we didn't even collaborate uh, outside of the institution. We we competed as a team, but we didn't collaborate uh, outside too much. We didn't think we needed to. We were arrogant. You know, we just thought, you know. But, um, but uh, I think industry is now expecting, you've heard this for a long time, but it's really, it's more and more true um, that they are not able to convene a group of scientists or engineers at that level in their own company that can't afford it. And so they're asking faculty members to do this, where faculty members have all these other mission areas that they're working on, including preparing the next generation. So we're kind of caught in a situation where we're all trying to do too much and uh, we're, we don't have the, um, the focus that we had a few decades ago. So, yet, I mean, I think you all, you wouldn't be here if you didn't enjoy being a faculty member and it's, it is a very rich thing. You'll, you'll appreciate as you move on in your career how much impact you've had on people. And I think as you get further along in your career, so you know, you become a full professor, and looking back, by that point, you will already know that your impact has been on people. You may have invented something, or uh, you may have an effect named after you, and that you can really enjoy for the rest of your life and will propagate in the textbooks or whatever they are in the future. But uh, I think you'll still look back, that's my prediction, and think it was the people. Because I, I have, a, there are a couple of my students who have gone on and done things that are much more significant than I ever did. So I, I you know, I, that's, I claim that my impact on them, whatever it was, was probably greater than the direct impact of my own work. Mm -hmm. Tim, you've had leadership roles uh, as you have described, and I have witnessed them all these years. Uh, I came not so much later mm -hmm. than you here. Uh, in fact, we were on that work search committee together, in fact, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and then we had to step out of it. So, uh, so my question is that you have now a great perspective, and uh, I had asked a similar question to some of the previous candidates who were visiting here. So, so, so now you have a perspective, uh, and could you overall ever call it as a very good university, but I would not call it as a great university in, in, in my own mind, and I do mm -hmm. not agree. So, whatever we agree or disagree on, there is always room for improvement, for sure. Mm -hmm. always, mm -hmm. yeah. So, do you see some very specific things in your, from your perspective now, uh, that need to improve here in order to make it even greater than what it is now? And what would be there is some specific thing? Because if we can solve some very few specific things, if it will really make a huge impact, that would be a huge return. Mm -hmm on the effort and investment that we'll make in this. Do you have any some small list like that? Well, I, I suppose I do. Um, I mean, uh, Professor Varma's question was, if you couldn't hear in the back, was about um, what, what do we need to do at Purdue to, um, to move this institution forward, to take it from, as they say, good to great. And, uh, you know, I, think I, I, I don't think I dispute your, your statement that it is a good university and not an excellent university on some metrics on some axes. On other axes, I think it's an excellent university. And it, it um, 
the, there are a couple of things that I reflect on. One is that, I don't know if you've read the paper that George Breslauer wrote um, a couple of years ago. He's the former provost at UC Berkeley. And I never really got to know him. He came, I think, after or, I, or maybe right at the end of my time there. But he wrote a paper about the history of Berkeley. And Berkeley has long been thought to be the number one public university in the country. And you know, I think that's disputable. But, but there's a lot of history there that would suggest that they have been able to make that claim for many, many decades. And you might dispute it now. or you might, in, in certain fields, it's not true. But overall, if you look at spanning anthropology to English to, to engineering, it's an awesome place in terms of the talent level. Um, it, uh, George Breslauer traced back in the history of Berkeley and why did, his big question was, um, why is Berkeley excellent? What, what caused that? What was, and there's a lot of reasons in there, but there was, a, I think it was Benjamin Wheeler. I might have the wrong president. I know he was a, a chancellor at Berkeley, but I can't remember if it was Wheeler or another one. But he made the point that there was a period in Berkeley's uh, history where the chancellor did promotion and tenure. I mean, literally, it, it all went through, and it was a tight filter through his desk. And he, I mean, he turned away more than he took. And he, he, this one person changed the trajectory of, of Berkeley. And I thought that was fascinating. I mean, a day, today you can't, it's kind of hard to do that. I mean, I guess you could, but, but he basically took promotion and tenure into his own hands and, and essentially decided, you stay, you don't. And, uh, the bar got so high that you know, Berkeley took off. Now, I don't know that that's a relevant action plan for <laughs> Yes, the next provost should, all of you who are on promotion and tenure committees, you know, you got, you got some more time on your hands. They're all coming to, no, and I think he, if I recall correctly, he met with every faculty member too. And you know, it was not a, uh, he just, that was his number one thing. Now, of course, things were smaller then, but you know, sometime after that, Berkeley was getting Nobel Prize after Nobel Prize after Nobel Prize. The weather didn't hurt. There's certain things about the Golden Hills of California uh, when, when it's not mudslide, earthquake, or, or whatever season. But, but, um, but you know, it, and many of you have been out there and lived in that environment. But uh, I think it was a special time, and that was a, kind of an exceptional case. But I, it still you, you know, it makes you reflect. You know, what would happen if we had a little different approach, a little more focused approach? Um, but then I'll, I'll give you the counter st statement to that. I'm not answering your question directly. We, we do get, um, if you look at the way we have traditionally since about 1990 uh, measured ourselves as, as universities, we've followed what I call the hype axis, which is Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. As, and we've li really looked at, okay, what can we do to be like Harvard, Yale, and Princeton? I look at a place like uh, Purdue or Virginia Tech, and that is off mission. I mean, that's really not what we are. It, it never was, and it never, I don't think it'll ever be. Um, we're a land-grant institution. We've got the engagement mission we take very seriously. No one credits that. You know, it doesn't appear in any, no one measures it, really, at least not yet well. And uh, I think that um, makes uh, institutions that are public, and especially land grants, um, in a different category. It's really hard to measure. Because if you look at faculty effort at a place like Harvard or even Berkeley, which is a public, but it, it doesn't have that land-grant spirit to it. It was a land-grant way back when, but it, doesn't, it isn't that now. Um, you, you, the faculty's effort is not as divided as it is at a place like Purdue. You know, we, we have a lot of things going on. You know, individuals in some departments may not feel that because you know, most of my colleagues, I think, in ECE don't really sense that. I mean, because it's not uh, ECE, I'm not to pick on ECE, but it, but it actually kind of lines up with the Harvards and the Berkeleys and the MITs in terms of, it, those are its peers. But if you go outside of a few of those departments, and chemical engineering might be one of those as well, you go outside and you, you find um, there are departments at Purdue that aren't present at other institutions that we might want to compare ourselves to and that uh, don't measure themselves the way that you know, I grew up thinking was important. I, you know, so I, I think the institution, Purdue, has its impact is much different, uh, much qualitatively different than, than uh, a Berkeley or certainly than a, a Hype. And um, you know, 
that has to be taken into account. What is the real mission of the institution? So I'm, I'm struggling with that at Virginia Tech right now because Virginia Tech's been on an upward trajectory. They're doing five, almost 500 million in research per year in expenditures, produce it about a little over 600 million. Uh, so they're not that different, but Virginia Tech's been on a very steep trajectory. And um, they, they want to stay on that trajectory. But the question is, is that going to take them off mission or, or are they measuring the right thing? Is research expenditures really a metric you want to track with? Um, so we're having those conversations right now about VT. About Purdue, I, I, you know, I, th I think Purdue's strength um, lately has been in interdisciplinary research, and uh, that's something that you know, started, at least from my perspective, with Martin Jiski's tenure. I, I'm sh I wasn't here before, so I don't know what the thinking was then, but, but it seemed to be a, a, a junction. Like in my career trajectory I was showing here, you put a little diamond there. Do we become a major interdisciplinary research-focused institution? And I think we've done that. Um, have we achieved what we could have? No, not even close. I think there's a, a whole upside there. Um, how to get there, I, you know, I wish it were simple, but um, it's probably deciding what we're not going to be. And um, you know, frankly, Purdue has done a pretty good job of that um, compared to other institutions. We are not, we're comprehensive, but we're not ridiculously comprehensive. We don't have everything. We have half of, one out of two, of every, you know, essentially, if you named all the disciplines. But um, one area that I think is going to become increasingly important, I guess it's easier to look forward than back, um, because we can't fix what, what has happened. We can react to what might be. And uh, one of the things that I, I look at for both Purdue and Virginia Tech is we have institutions that are balanced at a, at a, in a way that is forward-looking. It's really 21st century balance where we've got you know, 45, 50% of the effort is in the STEM disciplines, but we still have the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences. And if we can figure out a way to weave them together uh, stronger than they are right now, I think those institutions are gonna do a leapfrog over the institutions that are all liberal arts focused, which are almost entirely or um, all technology institutes. I think the, um, the model, uh, you know, Georgia Tech's a great institution, MIT's a great institution, Caltech, but they have missing pieces. You know, there, there are some kinds of problems that they can't attack. And uh, on the other hand, you look at some institutions like um, our um, IU and some of the traditional uh, public universities, the big ones, um, research universities, they come from a history of strong liberal arts and maybe not as strong in, in engineering and technology. Purdue and Virginia Tech and a handful of others have this kind of uh, balance that, that seems to be right, and I've said this at Virginia Tech, I really think it's true, that they are um, set up the way you probably would set something up if you were starting it now. You know, you would have that kind of balance the way it is right now and um, at Purdue and Virginia Tech. So I, I think we have, we're very well positioned going forward but it, integrating the disciplines further than we have, not just within engineering or not just within liberal arts, but really getting them tied up. Because you know, one of the, I'll, I'll tell you, just give an example of one of the things that has been eye-opening for me in talking with the folks at Virginia Tech, is this emerging field, and maybe those of you who are, are in it, they don't think it's emerging, but it it's really revol revolves around resilience. And it's, it's uh, whether it's community resilience or, re res in, or financial resilience, cybersecurity um, resilience, whatever it may be, um, or resilience against uh, the impact of climate change, but that that is emerging as a really interesting, you know, meta field, and it may I think it may end up becoming one of the cornerstones of a land grant university is this focus on resilience, and you can't do that from a technology institute. You know, Georgia Tech can't do that. I mean, they, they can try, but they're not going to do it by themselves. They're going to have to find partners. Um, I don't think um, uh, a university that it doesn't have a really strong engineering college and technology could do it either. You know, you really have to have them together, and they have to work together really well. And, uh, you know, we're not there yet, but I, I think those are the really big opportunities going forward. Uh, but this emphasis, continuous emphasis on um, excellence and raising the bar um, is, you know, that's got to be there too. And I think Purdue has it, it's not everywhere, it's not uniform, but, um, you know, it, it's, I've been very impressed with Purdue, you know, especially when I look back, uh, I think um, it has moved in a, in a very good direction. The hard 
thing to do, though, is to, is to um, reflect on where we've been in light of what we've been through with the recession and all the changes that we've been going through over the last few years. There are long-term trends that have affected us, but there is that this last few years has been crazy, absolutely crazy. And the question is, what's on the other side? I don't think we can see that yet. Mm -hmm. What is your primary goal in taking this role as the president at Virginia Tech? At first, I know it's going to change. Do you mm -hmm. get comfortable with the job? But what do you see in yourself in making a difference in how you want to set the path for the um, future of Virginia Tech? Well, that's a, that's a really good question and one that I'm about to be asked over and over. Um, and it, yeah, well, and, and it's not that I don't want to give away any secrets um, or s keep my powder dry, but um, it's a great question. I'm still thinking about that. I mean, I, I came to the institution, had a lot of conversations with people, and uh, talked a little bit about where I thought what the assets were, where we should go. I just reflected on one that I think is really important. That's getting the disciplines to, to work together on big problems. And you've heard that before. We, we, that's why Discovery Park was formed. But I'm talking beyond what we've done in the past. We, you know, really getting the arts and science and technology together. You know, really getting um, public policy and, you know, uh, and public affairs together with uh, our folks who work in the medical arena or healthcare arena. Uh, you know, we don't, it's hard at institutions like what we have to, to really do that well. We, no, no one else can do it, but we, we still struggle with how to do it well, and uh, I think that's where the real opportunities are. These big problems, um, defining the, the land grant of the 21st century, not the one that we, the last century or the century before that, which we still have a little of, uh, but really trying to, trying to build something that represents uh, where we need to go in the next, uh, the next few decades. So my thinking is still evolving. I, um, I'm, I do need to get to know Virginia Tech better. I've had, I think, it, something like 80 meetings with people there. But you know, they have a president, who Charles Steger, who's done a wonderful job. He's been there 14 years. He's been there 50 years, but he's been a president for 14. And um, you know, it's his last lap. And you know, I, I'm trying to keep a low profile until June 1st. But uh, I am learning and listening, and it's, it's fascinating. I think the one thing that um, is distinct, it, you have to find your, what distinguishes you. And um, the, the land grants that are balanced between STEM and the, the humanities and social sciences and arts are, um, and then with a smattering of professional schools, those sort of balanced institutions, I only count about six or seven of them in the country. So I, if I had to pick one, one you know, place to go to be a president, it would be one of those six or seven because I think they're the ones that are best positioned. It's hard to change that course. That's something that takes decades to move. So I, that's one thing that attracts me to Virginia Tech and, and has been an appealing part of being at Purdue. But I do think there's a huge um, opportunity there. And among those six or seven, I think we each have to distinguish ourselves. The one thing that is remarkable if you're on the Virginia Tech campus, every, when you all come to visit me, not all at once, um, <laughs> Besides the hokey stone replacing the red brick, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's just, uh, it, it's a very thematically consistent campus from an architectural point of view. The thing that strikes you is that the people are, um, all the people that I've met are very focused on service to humanity. That is their, the filter that gets them there. They wouldn't be there if it weren't for that. And it sounds kind of hokey. I don't mean H-O-K-I-E, but um, it sounds a little, um, odd to say that because everybody says, oh, of course we're in service to humanity. But they grew up, their motto from way back when was ut prosum, which basically means that I may serve. They're not a faith-based institution. They're a public university. There's nothing there to suggest that, that that comes out of that. Where it comes from is the Corps of Cadets. They were a military school for most of their, their time. They had 2,500 uh, Corps cadet members, and you had to be in the Corps, and you had to be male to be a Virginia uh, VPI, or before that, I've forgotten the, the military uh, name for the institution, but, but that, that was there for decades, and it just, it's relatively recent that they started admitting civilians, if you will, and then women, and, and it was all small. It was a couple thousand people. Now it's 31,000, and that, that growth has been spectacular and very rapid. So what's interesting about that is that that I may serve, that prosum motto, 
has been taken to heart by all of those 31,000 students. So it's, it's, not, it's not about serving your country in the military sense for all of them, that's obvious, that's, but it's, it's, a much, it's a service oriented place. The 2007 incident, the, the shootings in, in, in April 16th of 2007 uh, were a turning point for Virginia Tech and part of the reason that they have that deeply ingrained service mission. So the, the job for, for someone like me coming into a place like that, it's already there, but uh, when you talk about raising aspirations, you're talking about going beyond the I'll rake your leaves for you to, to I'll, I'll, I'm going to study, I'm going to work in this field, I'm going to be a researcher in this area because I'm going to solve this huge problem that's plaguing humanity. And that's how I can maximize my impact. So that, that culture is already there. It's just a matter of taking it up a notch. So the other thing that I think is um, important and I, you know, for Virginia Tech, and it, it, it is important for Purdue, and we've got to figure it out. Virginia Tech has a slight advantage there, and that is to have an urban center complementing your rural campus, because you, you know, the future is becoming more and more urban. And we were created, we were put out here <laughs> for a good reason. We needed land, you know, we, we have, agriculture's a big deal, still is. Uh, we want a college town environment, that's the positive, but we all, both Virginia Tech and Purdue suffer greatly from the dual career issue, which is getting worse by the, by the year, significantly worse every year. It's just harder and harder to find a dual career arrangement in a small town. The commute issue, you know, you pop something down in Indianapolis, well, there's some options, but it's not great. Chicago's close, fantastic city. It's in Illinois. Darn it, you know, why, why isn't that in Indiana? Uh, well, maybe that's good. In some ways that's great. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, I, I, one of the advantages that a Virginia Tech does have is that the national capital region is in the state. So the engineers that, and the others that graduate from Virginia Tech have options in the state that are, um, you know, quite nice. But, but it's got all the issues of Purdue in terms of this uh, challenge with the dual career, the, the whole thing. So those are big, big battles or big obstacles. They're threatening type, type things. Mm -hmm. So I can ask you to come back to the mentoring piece mm -hmm. again. Um, if, if you look at how, how successful you've been and if you, if you think about why you've been so successful and, and what uh, traits you have or behaviors or work habits, what, what, do you, what would you credit the most about yourself well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's nice to think about yourself as successful, but just because I've held positions doesn't, you know, I mean, I'm going to be a university president. That's pretty cool. But um, uh, I, I think you've always got to be kind of a work in progress. So I don't know that I, maybe in 20 years I can really answer that, but it, it's, I think it's still in progress because I'm still making mistakes. But but the um, the probably the thing that's helped me the most is, the, my informal mentors and listening, and not only listening to them tell me things or talk to me directly, but watching them. So one thing that, um, you know, I mentioned a couple of them uh, in conversations like this, but uh, I had one, uh, well, they've each taught me something. Vasilis Karamidis, some of you may know, I know Ernesto knows Vasilis, but I just mentioned him, just popped into my head. He was my division manager at Belcor, which meant he was, he had a group of 50 PhDs working on um, optoelectronic materials, and he, there were certain things about his style that I adopted. You know, they were so great, you know, some of his philosophies that, that I adopted. One was if you're in an organization that, that has a service orientation, you need to step out of that and lead at least half the time. You can, you can be of service to others half the time, but you need to be the intellectual leader the other half. You, you know, it's little things like that that may be not relevant to some situations, but I picked up some things from each of them and, and try to keep those at the forefront. The other thing that I think is important for any, anybody here who's uh, thinking about doing something in an administrative role or, something, or, or any kind of leadership role is to um, try to, what they say, they, you often hear it termed, uh, lean into conflict, like do not walk away from conflict. I mean, you may not be able to solve a problem, but don't ignore it and, and you know, because you don't want to be in an uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. 
been reflecting back then. Uh, We've known each other for, what, 1990, I think we met? Yeah. That long, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a common denominator from your perspective on the, um, you know, on the things you attribute to having been your biggest impact, the call of work to do, or are they all disparate and uh, non connected uh, contributions to those things? I don't, I, yeah. I, well, that's what I was reflecting on here, and that's where we, you know, Dick was asking what what's the constant thing you measure, and that's why I've settled on impact because I, you know, there's it varies from role to role, institution to institution. The best thing I can say about um, all the institutions I've been fortunate to be part of is that they all raise my aspirations. They're all intellectually challenging and um, made you stretch and made you do things or gave you opportunities to do things that were dangerous. And so I, I think um, I wish that all of you, you know, of course Purdue's got that environment if you, if you take it, but uh, uh, I hope you all have, for, throughout all your careers, especially Peter and other people early in their careers, have uh, the opportunity to be in institutions all throughout where you're, there's some danger involved and there's some, you know, challenging conversations and people who think differently. Okay, well, well, let's thank Tim. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.